Thank you. Thank you. All right, first of all, um, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble when I go into my office if I don't show you this. Now, I know people don't like to put their names on things, but here's the deal. I promise you we're not going to do anything weird with it. But we do want to know if you want to get updates from the NERV. That is the website where government gets exposed. You're going to read stories on the NERV that you will not read in the mainstream media. You're going to see things happening in your state that you didn't know about and you wouldn't know about if we didn't tell you. So I encourage you, give us an email address. We don't give it to anyone else. And we will send you these updates. Um, so, the government back in the 1800s and today. But I, what struck me was that we compensated a speaker for losing money on a horse race. Well, just a few months ago, we compensated our speaker for staying in a hotel in Charleston, Charleston Place, which is not an inexpensive hotel, is it? And um, he's from Charleston. That's right. But, you know, this was uh, one of those conferences that they hold down there. And he and a couple of other Charleston representatives said, well, no, they didn't know the state was compensating them. It's a $1,000 bill each. Each. So the $1,000 for the horse race back yeah. then is now $1,000 to $1,400 for a nice hotel stay for one of those leadershipy speakery conferences that, by the way, was defended as being, <clears throat> quote, good for economic development. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, uh. There was one legislator, by the way, on that trip who said, actually, to his credit, you know what, I did know the state was going to compensate me, and I went to the conference, and I thought it sounded like a good conference. Hey, at least he was honest about it, right? So this kind of thing seems small in scale. But that article was really good. I want a copy of that. Because here's what it illustrates. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed in the state of South Carolina. And I am, for the record, an eighth generation South Carolinian. Saul Blott and Edgar Brown were at my parents' wedding. So yeah, I know how it works. And it doesn't work well. This is probably one of the most pivotal points in our history in South Carolina, and I'm going to tell you why. When Talbert and a few others got out on the road a couple of weeks ago, we used some terms that you've heard in there. That, that article, we used the word corruption. Our governor and our attorney general went around the state to talk about ethics reform. The Speaker of the House bit back with no, no to her ethics reform. We're, <laughs> we're working on ethics reform. Right? Folks, ethics reform is a gentle term for what's wrong in our state. It is corrupt. I'm going to say it again, and you can quote me, this government is corrupt. What's happening in the state of South Carolina is corruption. Just because it's legal doesn't mean it's not corrupt, because it is. We have abuses of power taking place in this state that would knock on their socks a Chicago alderman or a New York assemblyman, right? The kind of stuff that happens down here is shocking to people. Let me just put it to you in perspective, all right? Your judges are chosen by the legislature, right? Now, that in and of itself. The legislature picks the judges who rule on their laws. Separation of powers there? I think not. But let's make it more interesting. There's a screening commission that screens out the judges to decide which judges get voted on in the legislature. I mean, after all, 170 of them can't screen judges, right? So, 10 people are on the screening commission. Six of them are legislators, of course. Four of them are from the general public. Let me tell you who two of them are. One of the people who chooses your judges is Senator Jake Knotts. Oh. How about that? How about that? Senator Glenn McConnell, your lieutenant governor, put him on there. Jake Knotts is one of 10 people who decides 
which judges get a vote. You know who one of the other people is? Speaker Harold's brother. Mm -hmm. That's right. The Speaker of the House put his brother, who's a lawyer, on the commission of 10 people who chooses your judges. That's right. Nobody else does this, folks. Nobody else runs their state this way. But that's what happens in South Carolina. And I think the corruption took on a whole new life when you all lost your elections. And let me say this. Am I standing up here saying the Supreme Court deliberately stole your elections? No. No. What I'm saying is your elections were taken from you through a process so bizarre and so ridiculous that to stand up here and talk about it doesn't even make sense. It's absolutely crazy that your elections were taken from you. It is crazy that 200 challengers to incumbents were thrown off the ballot while pretty much, I think every other incumbent was saved except one down in Dorchester. Mike Rose, Senator Mike Rose. That guy's been talking about ethics reform for a little too long, it seems. Now, again, with the conspiracy theories, you could go a long way with this one, folks, but I'm gonna tell you, it doesn't matter because your system is so broken that it went on autopilot, and even when a couple of those legislators made a half-hearted attempt to save our elections, they couldn't. The rules were in place in such a way that there was nothing you or anyone else could do about it. Is that not corruption? This is the United States of America, and your challengers, the ones you put on the ballot, because now that we have roll call voting, you can see how they vote, right? So all across the state, you did what you're supposed to do in an American Republic government. You got people to run for office, and they stepped up and did it, and then they threw them off. Is that anything short of corruption? There you go. And the fact that these guys choose their judges. Now, you throw in the fact there are a few other little things, little tidbits for you. Those guys make backroom billion dollar deals all the time. They don't tell you who the company is. They won't tell you how much they're spending. They will not tell you how many, quote, jobs were created. They will give you zero information on the total cost of these deals. You get nothing. But you know what? You're supposed to do it because it's good for the economy. Right? Now, guess what? You know the last one, the big Boeing deal? I don't think I knew this until recently. Or if I did, I didn't put it together. But here comes a company that gets billions of dollars in subsidies, or at least one billion that we know about. Mind you, you guys are all paying taxes. No tax breaks for you. But here comes this company, and they lobby, and they get this big incentive deal, and everybody says they're creating 6,000 jobs. Nobody can prove that to us, by the way, or at least no one has. I'd love to see those figures. But then later we find out that there is a Boeing executive chairing the board of the South Carolina Research Authority, which is a state agency. I don't know what it does exactly. Neither do the legislators who appropriate money for it, by the way, but I can tell you what it says it does. Shares technology, whatever that means. Basically, this is the agency, folks, that your House and Senate leadership put in charge of running the economy, and that is what they did. Talk about Agenda 21. Guess what? This stuff is happening already at the state government level. So, the chair of one of the state agencies in charge of the economy is an executive for a company that got a billion-dollar subsidy. The Speaker of the House puts his brother on the committee that picks the judges. Oh, and let's not forget there's a bank run by politicians, Speaker Harrell and a couple of others, that's funneling billion plus dollars into special projects, road projects all over the state. I wish I had the chart that Dana Beach of the Coastal Conservation League put up to show you that the counties who have gotten all the money are, wait for it, the same counties in which these politicians live, and the members of this board live. There are 30-something counties in the state that have not gotten a dime. 
in transportation money, as far as we know, right? So, who got all that money? How about Charleston? <laughs> How about the 526 extension project? Folks, how is this not corruption? I don't care if it's legal. It's wrong. And the reason that we have this mess, because the recipe for corruption is a concentration of power and secrecy. If you have concentration of power and government is allowed to operate in pure secrecy, guess what? Tell me where that has not led to tyranny. Who has an example in which a few leaders have all the power and they can do everything in secret and we have not had a tyrannical government. <laughs> yeah, but there are probably no secrets in heaven. <laughs> I think God's pretty open, personally. I think God is about as transparent as you get. What you see is what you get there. So when we really pull back and look at the fact, you know, we all want a lot of changes in this state. We want education reform. We want lower taxes. We want caps on spending. We want conservation efforts that don't cripple business. We want the kind that start in the communities. We want freedom to choose. We want a free market health care system, not a government mandated health care system. In other words, we want less government and we want choices ourselves, right? right. But you know what? We're not going to have those until we tear down this corrupt government. So after a lot of research, we have identified eight things to start with. I'm not saying that these are the eight things that will change our state entirely, but I'm telling you everything else you care about, you might as well write off because it will not happen until we put an end to the concentration of power and secrecy. And I will say this, we hear politicians scrambling to talk about ethics reform because they're scared of you. We know more than we ever have about what they're doing. But I hope you will send a message back to them that we will not have either ethics or reform defined by any politician. It <coughs> must be decided by you. So, first, judicial independence. No way do you put an end to corruption until your judges are independent of the legislature. I would get that. Well, we're going to have to have a constitutional amendment. And we are going to have to empower the governor to appoint the judges with advice and consent of the Senate. Is it perfect? Nothing is perfect. Is it the founder's model for separation of powers? Yes, it is. And I think that's what we need to go back to. We don't have to reinvent the wheel on this. It's already been done. That is the way judges need to be chosen. Enough with the excuses. Give us our judges. Free our judges. Well, you know what? I think that, to be honest, I'll tell you what I think about that. Um, I do not think judges ought to be running for election. I don't think the political process is the right process. I think we can hold the governor directly accountable and our senators directly accountable for their choices of judges. But I do agree and believe that the founder's model is right there. And that is separation of powers, but less corruption of the political process. If you take the number of people who select judges and change it from because you can vote for the governor and you can't vote for the guys who put the judges on right now. Bottom line, you can't vote for the speaker and you could not vote for Glenn McConnell when he was in charge. Now you have a president pro tem and judiciary chairman. Some of you may be able to vote for Senator Corson. Some of you probably are not able to. But you see what I mean? The key to power is you can control it. That is the difference, and that was the idea behind the separation of powers there. Two points of input for you, with your president and with your senator. So you have the input there, and there is accountability. Right now, zero accountability for this judicial screening commission. So that is the difference. I stand by that model. I believe the founders were right, and I think that's the best way to choose our judges. I can tell you one thing, what we have now, is the worst way, the very worst way. Also, here's another one, and they don't like this, not surprisingly, it's not like they like the first one, but I'll tell you, they really don't like this one. No more legislative control of the executive branch of government. Yes, when it comes to consolidating power, you bet we consolidate all the executive branch power in the hands of the governor 
whom we all elect. The governor ought to choose the cabinet. The governor ought to run state agencies. The governor ought to be in charge of the education system. The governor ought to be in charge of running the state, folks. But instead, we have all these constitutional officers. Why? Because the legislature likes it that way. They like it that way. If you have eight of these other constitutional officers, and they're all sort of jockeying for power, and they all want to preserve their power, then the legislature gets to dole it out, right? Plus, we diffuse power this way. Concentrate the power, concentrate the accountability in the hands of the person you can control. It's not about giving more power to the governor. It's about giving you the power, period. So that has to be done. We have to give the governor the responsibility. And by the way, the more responsibility we give a governor, what do you want to bet? We can take some of our power away from the government in the first place. You can elect governors who promise to give it back to you. Those legislative leaders are never going to give it back to you. And they control the whole state through these little boards and commissions, right? So that has to be done. And by the way, it's time to shorten the legislative session. How many times have we said that? Right? How many times have we said? We do not need a bunch of legislators in Columbia, three days a week, coming up on six months a year sometimes, with this huge machine that it creates of lobbyists and consultants and lawyers and a lot of lawmaking, cut it in half, citizen legislature, it's a part-time job, it should be a real part-time job. Lawmakers make laws, and they many, don't need to do that. Many small states have that. They do. Many large states do as well. Right. How do you get a law well, passed that passed undermines the power of the legislature? How do you get the law that. passed? How do you get it passed? The law that is going to undermine the power of the legislature. The same way we got roll call. That's passed. exactly right. And, and the answer is yeah. you guys, right? The answer is you at home. And Talbert will give you the tactics on that because he knows better than I. But I, I can tell you this, it starts with your people. It starts with you all holding them accountable, not just for their votes, but for challenging this system, for standing up against it behind closed doors to their leadership. Push your senators and your representatives to be accountable for this leadership. You realize your House member chooses the speaker, right? And the senators choose the president pro tem. You do have some control. You do have the ability to demand at least some sort of accountability. <laughs> and we scared him to death. Five votes. <laughs> That's all right. He was challenged you know more though? than he's ever been. That is what it takes. Do you want it to change? This is what it's going to take. Um, and now those three reforms that I've laid out are about the, the power, the concentration of power. These are not small changes. This is a system that has been in place pretty much forever, since the 1800s and to some degree before that. Changing it will not be easy, but do not make the mistake of telling yourself that it's impossible. Remember who you're compromising with, not each other, but them over your power. So that's what we have to stop telling ourselves, and I'll get to that in a minute. And the next five deal with transparency. Let's have full transparency in every one of these incentive deals all across the board from the front end to the deal itself to the reporting on the back end. No more backroom billion dollar deals. No more. We have to get rid of that. We have to put transparency on that. We have to end lawmakers' ability to police themselves. Yes. House and Senate ethics committees? Come on. In many ways, yes. But it's also absurd to think that we're going to have any recourse, even if they could. You know, I think it's, first of all, virtually impossible to violate an ethics law in South Carolina. I actually think they have to work at it because the laws are so weighted in their favor. Everything they do is legal. Of course it's legal. They make the laws. They choose the judges. They run the executive branch of government. Of course everything they want to do is legal, right? So we're going to have to get rid of their committees. And by the way, it's time for every politician, every elected official, to disclose his or her sources of income. Yeah. Every one. If we don't know who pays you, how can we determine 
if there is a conflict of interest when you vote. It's that simple. They do it in other states. They do it in almost all other states. And by the way, they do it in the United States Congress. Pretty sure they can do it in the state of South Carolina. And by the way, if you're one of those people who has very, very sensitive <coughs> income sources, don't run for office. <laughs> Make a choice. Be a private detective or be a legislator. That's up to you. But your right to see who pays them should not be compromised. We need to strengthen the FOIA laws, the open records laws. You heard the governor, did you hear her a couple weeks ago? Say we've got to get rid of that legislative exemption to FOIA. Well, there you go, good for her. Of course the legislature shouldn't exempt itself from the Freedom of Information Act with this excuse, which I love. This is one of my favorites. And they're good, don't get me wrong. They've come up with some good ones over the years, but please, wait for this one. They get very sensitive correspondence from their constituents. <laughs> Why are they dating them? <laughs> um, some of them. Some of them are. Yeah. Uh, you know why Bob Brown needed a motel room in Charleston? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll stay away from those sensitive areas. Um, but I will say this, folks. I would remind all of us that our legislators are not there to perform specific services for us. Certainly nothing so sensitive on public time and public dime that, that's, that it would be so protected. And by the way, if you really need a special super favor from your legislator and you don't want anyone to know you're asking for the super special favor from the legislator, one, I'd say rethink that. And two, pick up the phone, all right? They need to disclose all of their correspondence the way other public officials have to. But you know what? Governor Haley didn't go far enough. She left a little something out. Herself. Herself. Mm -hmm. Her agencies. She forgot to say, gosh, and by the way, every state agency ought to quit charging taxpayers for labor to disclose FOIA when it's our information to begin with and we already pay these people. And they need to quit dragging their feet. I would suggest that Governor Haley today issue an executive order having every single state agency over which she exerts any control agree to these premises here, which are that we don't allow private information in the first place in state government. They ought to make it easy to get it. It shouldn't cost a dime, and it shouldn't take any time for them to get their hands on information that belongs to you anyway, right? So let's put an end to that. And by the way, every legislator ought to go ahead and step up and disclose his or her income. And to our friend, Attorney General Alan Wilson, who sat right here at one of your last meetings, Talbert, I would say this, and I like Alan. I really do. I think he's a nice guy. Alan is empowered right now to do some things for us. He could enforce the FOIA law so that every <laughs> entity in the state that gets or spends a public dollar is subject to FOIA. That means the Ports Authority, the South Carolina Research Authority, and the Municipal Association, and the School Board Association, and every single entity that receives public dollars. And you know what? Far too few of them consider themselves public, but they are. That law we'd like to see enforced. And this leads me to my last point. There's another law that I'd like to see our Attorney General enforce. It's on the books. We discovered it quite by accident, by the way. This has to do with the state budget. There is a law in the books that requires the governor to write the budget. Did you guys know the governor was supposed to write the budget? Yeah. That makes perfect sense that the governor should be required to write the budget. And I don't mean a suggested budget that they can throw in the trash. I mean the state budget setting the state spending priorities that the governor was elected to set. That's who ought to write the budget. Can you imagine how different it would be if the governor had to stand up, hold up the state budget, and say, by the way, this is my work, right? I take responsibility for the largest budget in state history. What do you want to bet things would change? What do you want to bet? And second half of that, House and Senate finance committees are required to hold open joint hearings to consider the governor's budget. Never happened. <coughs> That's law. Can you imagine three points of public 
input on the budget, first to the governor, second to that committee, and third to your individual legislators. Folks, right now, you know what happens? They lock the doors and two or three of them decide what the spending is gonna be. That has to change. This law makes sense. I'm sure they didn't mean to pass it, but there it is. <laughs> so let's enforce it. And, and we need to start, you wanna know what to do to get this stuff done? Don't let these politicians off the hook for this stuff. Not just for voting right on the laws and when they come up or the bills, but how about forcing them to be accountable right now. They don't hear from you enough on that stuff. And I think that asking them to do what they can already do is important because I'll tell you this, they don't want to change this. Does anyone here think they want this? <laughs> That's precisely why they're getting out front as fast as they can to introduce their ethics reform packages. I'm gonna say something pretty strong. Don't listen to them when it comes to this. They will not want these reforms. It takes their power away. Don't listen to their excuses. No excuses. It's what Talbert said about roll call voting. If we had let them define the terms, we would never have it. You define the terms. This is the tough talk. This is time. We can fix our state. The freest state in America is on the other side of this wall. And I'm talking about real freedom. The kind that feels free in your life every day. The kind of thing where you can choose an energy company. Where you can control which schools your children go to regardless of your resources. At least you don't have to pay for failure anymore. The kind of government where your lives are private and your property is private. The kind of government that is controlled by you in which instead of having the nation's most powerful, least accountable politicians, we have the least powerful, most accountable politicians. That is a free state. That's a free state. That's the kind of state you should want. And I would ask you to consider something. Why should you settle for anything less? Why should you compromise with politicians because this isn't the kind of thing where 49% to 51% want something of citizens, right? That's not this kind of deal. There are a lot of issues out there that we may all want one side on, but hey, there are other concerns for other mm -hmm. citizens with whom we might disagree, but they don't agree on the issue we do. You see what I mean? So they're going to stand up and fight. We're going to stand up and fight like the lottery. That was a good example of that, the state lottery. I was on the losing side of that battle. But guess what? Citizens spoke up. They went and voted on that thing. I didn't like it, but we had to compromise on what that lottery looked like. But this is not compromise among citizens. This is compromise with 170 legislators, with a governor, with what, five, six, seven constitutional officers, why should all of us compromise with them on how much power they get to keep? We will never be anything but what we are, I'm one of America's poorest states. And, and I, I will finally end with this. We don't think big enough for ourselves. We really don't. We don't set very high standards in this state for ourselves. Why would we sit around and talk about jobs as if having a job is the goal? As if creating jobs is a great thing. What happened to greatness? What happened to prosperity? Those are the goals. A job is a means to the end. But yet our governor and our speaker and our Senate finance chairman are all running around talking about all the jobs they're creating. Why is that good enough for you? Is that good enough for you? Is that what you want? Mm -mm. No. I hope not. Come on, guys. We can do better. Well, better. How about we can have what we want? How about we can live in the freest state in America? Someone has to live in the freest state in America. Why should it be anyone but us? This is what's standing in your way. That's not an exaggeration. This is standing in your way. Everything you're talking about, all of the concerns that you have about Washington, start here. They decide how much federal money gets spent in the state, not Lindsey Graham, okay? 
They decide which regulations are applied because they accept the money in the first place. They allow Washington, D.C. to control more than one-third of the dollars spent on state government. They decide that. That's who you need to hold accountable. So I hope that we can send some pretty strong messages. We are building a coalition. We're going to ask you to look at this. Also on the back is the Citizen's Guide to Following the State Budget that we put together for you because that's coming up in a few months. But in the meantime, let us know if you have questions. That's what we're here for. And folks, we're going to talk pretty tough over the next three months. I know you've never heard me do that before. <laughs> but gear up because it's going to be a long battle. And um, we appreciate that you all are here doing this. And I want to say one of the ultimate warriors in the fight for the freest state in America is this guy. There is no one who has stood up to those politicians more than Talbert Black and no one who has gotten out there and given of his time and his resources more than this person right here. So, Talbert, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.